Hello. Lots of familiar faces. Um, so before we get the signal going, um, how many of you um, are Android developers here? Okay. And the rest of you are iPhone developers? Yeah, a couple of iPhone developers, okay. A anything else, any, any other developers, any interesting stuff? iPhone or Android? Windows, got it, I forgot about that one. <laughs> so, um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about um, what LTE is and then we're going to talk about why you would care about it, and then we're going to talk about some of the ideas how you can take advantage of LTE. Um, so um, before we start, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm actually one of the co-founders of San Francisco Android User Group, uh, along with my brother, Sasha, who you probably know better because he's the one who shows up all the time, uh, and I just show up occasionally. I'm also the author of Learning Android, a book published by O'Reilly, our sponsor tonight, um, and I'm a co-chair of upcoming Android Open conference in October here in the city. Uh, so that's, uh, that's something that's um, very exciting because I think it's gonna be a very sort of big gathering, comprehensive conference about Android. So uh, with that, I wanna tell you a little bit about what LT is. Um, and why you would care about it. So here are some of the essential sort of good things about, about LTE. So LTE is faster. Um, you probably already knew that, so it's a faster network. Uh, it's, it, it provides for a much richer content. So you can do m uh, more things with LTE than you were able to do before. And it's a safer network. So unlike previous 2G, 3G networks, it provides for certain, uh, certain security features that were not present before. So essentially LTE, m m the point of this talk is that LTE is not just yet another incarnation of, of uh, you know, 3G, 2G, 3G, 4G, uh, and, and so on, right? So we're gonna look at uh, each of these separately. So in terms of the speed, LTE is much faster both up, upstream and downstream, so that's the, the quadrant on the left. So we have 86 megabits uh, per second going up and 26 going, uh, 28 going down on average. Average speed is between 12 and, uh, and five. But most importantly, we have a very low latency. So the speed is one thing, when it's all said and done, the latency is another. So uh, you have a very, you have basically a very um, a wide uh, bandwidth spectrum on which you can do a lot of, you can push a lot of data. You have a, a decent throughput, and you have a very low latency. That's over 50% faster than our standard 3G networks that we that we have today. So what this really means to you as an app developer is that it enables a whole slew of new services that you can develop for, such as. Um, HD video, conferencing, things that require fast interaction uh, back and forth across the network. They're suddenly possible on, on this network. So in terms of the bandwidth, uh, these are just some numbers to kind of give you an idea. So the spectrum that we have for 3G is much more narrow than the one that we have for, um, for LTE. So LTE provides for way more lanes of traffic, if you, if you will. Um, it accomplishes um, the, the faster network speed, not just by having more uh, actual bandwidth uh, or um, a spectrum to, to work with, but it also does some interesting things with the, uh, using multiple antennas, multiple channels, things like that to actually get that speed going and uh, and to keep the latency levels down. So essentially, 2G um, was a, a, you know 2G and 3G networks were built to to handle voice and a little bit of data, and LTE is basically built from ground up to be specifically for data or for IP traffic. So that's sort of a big deal. Um, around LT. So in terms of latency, these are some numbers, um, you know, how it compares to the standards that we have today. So today we have the uh, about 65 to uh, 50 to 65 uh, milliseconds in terms of the, the network latency. With LT, that number goes down to about 10. So it's a substantial improvement in, uh, uh, in responsiveness. We also have a, a much better theoretical throughputs, right? So it, it's one thing to have a lot of bandwidth. It's another thing if that it's kind of like having a freeway that that becomes a parking lot, right? So it's not just how many lanes you have, but it's also how, how many how fast is it moving? So theoretically, with LTE, we have a much better bandwidth um, and 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 throughput as well at the same time. So that enables basically richer content and richer applications when it's all said and done. 
yeah, question. So the question is what the blue bars are, and they represent specific LT representation uh, implementations. So we're going to talk a little bit about later on what LT is from technical standpoint because it's really um, a collection of whole bunch of different technologies put together into one uh, one umbrella, and so that's why you're seeing multiple different bars uh, there um, as well. Technically, YMAX is also one of the LT um, subsets as, uh, as, as well. So, uh, but basically, what we're talking about here is what is possible with some of the technologies that that are coming up. Uh, just a quick question: How many of you know what LT as a three-letter acronym stands for? Just curious. Ah, it's about a third. So it's a long-term evolution, right? So it's basically a whole bunch of things that we're doing to, to get the network on a same standard, on an IP standard going forward, and so that everything is sort of unified as opposed to uh, various different things that we have going on right now that are all over, all over the place. Yeah, so YMAX is 3.9G standard. Uh, so it's almost LT. So it, 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 it's got some LT components to it, uh, but it, it depends on the definition as well, um, uh, uh, you know, how, how it gets qual uh, classified. So. Um, so what LT provides um, in terms of um, in, in terms of having the network like this, you can basically do a much richer content that, that, um, and a richer set of applications, right? So a lot of these things are going to be up to you to figure out what is possible, uh, what kind of applications you're going to develop on top of it. But it just gives you um, ability to do things like HD movies, uh, HD video, multi-part video, right? Uh, Real-time gaming, cloud computing, enhanced reality. So all these services are suddenly possible because we have uh, more bandwidth and low at a lower latency so far, right? So that's that's uh, that, that's what it means to be a richer. Um, just to give you an um, um, give you an idea in terms of the actual identifiers that we use for devices. So on a standard 2G and 3G devices, we typically use a 10-digit identifier to, to represent a device. Well, that means you can only represent so many devices. It's sort of, it's sort of like IPv4, right? Uh, we're running out of numbers, essentially. We're, uh, with LTE, we're basically using a 15-digit identifiers. Um, and what that means is that we can provide for um, way more devices on the network. So what does that really mean? Are we going to have way more people? Are we going to have, you know, suddenly go from 1 billion to 10 billion people? It's unlikely that it's going to happen overnight, right? But it, it does allow for an interesting concept of having machines also participate um, as, as citizens on the wireless network. And that's something that's very, very interesting about LTE that wasn't possible with the older 3G technologies just because we were simply running out of IDs for, for uh, the, the actual devices that are connected. Um, another thing that LTE provides that's really unique is the quality of service, right? So basically, you can have certain traffic at, uh, yield to uh, other traffic. So for example, if I want to do video conferencing with LTE, I can basically uh, say that my video conferencing uh, requires priority service. So as such, it's going to move to a faster lane. And if you have things that are, th that are not as important, like for example, asynchronous email, uh, that can move into the slower lane and basically yield to things that need, need a faster responsiveness. So, so that's something that is very, very interesting and sort of new, and um, it provides for a new set of applications, such as, as, like I said, video conferencing, but that's just one of the ideas. It's up to you guys to come up with other ideas for apps that take advantage of this new possibility of the, of the technology. Uh, what's a multi-part video? So it's basically a video that carries, for example, multiple, uh, uh, imagine it's multiple languages or multiple soundtracks. Um, so uh, m multiple points of view, things like that. Um, so that becomes, it's basically a video that's far beyond what we have at the DVD level today. So, so basically, or um, you know, or even lower streaming quality, so it's beyond that. Um, so, a little bit about the, um, so, so this is sort of like what the, um, the usage of various services is today in terms of the bandwidth. So basically the size of the little bubble represents the, the, the data usage, so how much data a certain service uses. And then we also have uh, the, uh, the throughput, how much throughput does actual 
service require. So for example, on the top left corner, we have video streaming, right? So video streaming requires a lot of, um, uh, is a lot of data, but it's also a lot of data moving at a fast speed. Right, it's, it's not, for, for example, downloading um, some file like an FTP service is a lot, potentially a lot of data, but you don't really care that much about speed because it's not gonna affect your, your experience uh, since you're not really watching, unless you're watching the progress bar move, right? Uh, then it may affect your experience. But for a movie, it does. So for example, uh, so a video requires a high throughput and a lot of data moving at the same speed. Um, whereas on the opposite side of the spectrum, we have SMS, which basically doesn't require a lot of data. It's really, really tiny in terms of data, um, and, um, and so lives in the lower right corner. There is the, the, the lower uh, axis is basically how much we're using such a service, right? So SMS, we use quite a bit because it's really fast and it doesn't require a lot of data. Video, on the other hand, we, use, we don't use as much, but it's much more expensive. Okay, so what LTE is basically shifting this focus. So suddenly it's going to be possible to move the video streaming from the left side of the of the quadrant all the way to the to the to the right side, or at least the middle. So we're going to be able to um, enjoy it more frequently, more often, and have a great experience at the same time. Right? To kind of pick a couple of, couple of extremes. Similar a similar thing with audio, which we use a lot to stream. Uh, music right now, but it doesn't require as as much of a throughput, although collectively it does use a lot of data. It's just because we use it much more. So we're going to see audio, for example, become more of a mainstream type of a service. Yes, there's a question in the back. So the question is about the additional power consumption um, for for uh, um, uh, LTE. So LTE, LTE basically did a lot of, uh, so power is one of the very important considerations uh, for LTE. We'll talk about some, some of the best practices, but that's been taken into account quite a bit. Um, and um, so, yeah, so we'll, we'll talk about it uh, a little later as well. Um, so the, the, the short answer is as long as you're on an IP, a network is going to be much more efficient than if you're flip-flopping between different networks. Just to kind of give you an idea of what, what are the, the expensive things to do. Another thing that LTE kind of brings to the table is that it simplifies the wo worldwide roaming. So basically, LTE is becoming a standard, an IP standard that is crossing the globe. It's going to become the, uh, the, the standard for all the mobile operators around the world. And we'll see a little bit about the adoption later on. So what that means is that the worldwide roaming becomes, uh, is becoming easier. So you, you, it's going to be easier for you to take your phone overseas. I'm not sure how this may apply to you as an app developer developing applications, but it could have some interesting implications. Um, one little detail that I wanted to mention here, although it sounds ideal that we're gonna have, you know, the um, sort of one set of devices across the globe with economies of scale, the prices of devices coming up, uh, down, and so forth. The devil is really in the details of the spectrum of the, the, the uh, bandwidth. So we're gonna still be seeing certain carriers in certain countries use different frequencies when it's all said and done. So for the near future, you're likely going to still have different devices in different countries. But nonetheless, the technology is sort of getting centralized to the same standard, so we should experience certain economies of scale when it comes to the price of the actual devices. That means more smartphones in, uh, in, as, a, as a percentage of total devices on, online, right? Uh, so... Another advantage of LTE is that it is safer. So it's actually not just a, here's the dumb pipe that, that is gonna carry your bits across faster, but it also provides for a lot of safety features on the network. So basically, um, network provides authentication. So in this, it's 128-bit uh, authentication. So you can now have your uh, users authenticate securely, and so we know basically who they are, and uh, that, that can prevent uh, basically sessions hijacking and things like that on the network. Um, we have the SIM robust and non-invasive key storage. So there's a way to store, store the keys um, securely using the network. Encrypted data uh, communication. So uh, by default, all the IP traffic is encrypted. So basically, you don't need to worry about that as much. Net the network now handles that uh, for you, and it's given, it's, you, know, you can take it for granted, essentially. 
Uh, some other features are that uh, identity, uh, there's uh, the, the identity protection against the snoo uh, snooping. So basically, by having network worry about all these things, it's harder for somebody to hijack uh, your, your phone, phone line and to have a scandal like that happen, right? Um, um, we have basically a granular security uh, per service, so we can set different security levels on a different service. This plugs back into the quality of service uh, features, so you can basically have uh, things like email uh, uh, adhere to different criteria than things like video and so forth. Uh, there's also the IPsec for tunneling communication. So you can now have um, uh, certain applications take advantage of connecting using uh, IPsec tunnels, which enables a whole bunch of new enterprise features uh, when it comes to uh, leveraging the network, right? So you can now have a safer enterprise experience on the mobile phones, unlike, unlike today. Or at least you don't have to worry about it uh, like, you, like you do today. So essentially, um, the, the, what I'm comparing sort of the networks to are, are the, the roads, right? So we, we're still connecting point A to point B. And just like in the old days, we sort of had you know, single lane roads that were designed for you know, just pedestrian traffic and such. 2G uh, network was really designed for voice. We didn't really have a concept of a data back then. Um, 3G we got better. So with 3G, the third generation of networks, we essentially enable data as well. So we had voice and data live together on the same network. But it, that, that doesn't mean that we had any priority over voice. Voice didn't have any guarantees, didn't have any security, didn't have any quality of service. None of that was available uh, or is available today on a, on a standard 3G, 3G network. So we basically have a bigger road with a lot of traffic still stuck on it. And, and running relatively slow. So um, essentially what happened over time is we built a, a mobile network that was designed for people talking to people, right? That's where we started with this whole thing. We took the landlines, we ripped them out, we built a mobile network that allowed us to talk without any, uh, any wires and such. So it's still people talking to people. What, what we're doing with LTE is we're basically um, shifting gears quite a bit. We're, we're building a much bigger, more important network. But, but what I'm trying to say here is that the network is not, uh, it, it, just like in when we build a free, freeway network in, in the United States, it, it, it wasn't just the faster road. It enabled a whole bunch of new services. It enabled interstate commerce. It enabled McDonald's at the you know, uh, freeway exits. Um, it enabled people, it enabled suburbs. Um, so a whole bunch of new things were generated out of this faster prioritized network. So LTE is sort of having similar impact or a potential to make a similar impact when it comes to mobile communications. So basically, one thing that I mentioned earlier is what that means is that we're now enabling machines to talk to machines as well as people, right? And that's a big opportunity here because now we have um, IPv6 available to us, which means that every single device can have a, um, a connection to the same network that we as humans do, right? So your, your bus can have connection to your bus stop, can have a connection to your mobile phone, can have a connection to your office, to a ferry, uh, to, to your bike clock, to your thermostat at home, to your alarm clock, et cetera, et cetera. So all these devices can now live on the same network and can be interconnected and can actually talk to each other. So we have the, the, the plumbing for it we have the opportunity to build something with it, and what's missing right now is sort of the intelligent apps that take advantage of this potential, right? So this is just an idea um, that uh, an artist generated for New York City, uh, making a claim for a New York City domain name, right? So we have basically traffic, uh, traffic lights, talking to fire alarms, talking to the curb, talking to the plumbing to, uh, down, uh, down under, talking to the subway system, talking to the parking meter, to light posts, et cetera, et cetera. So suddenly things can live on the same network as, as, as people. So that's sort of a big deal. Uh, this is something that was generated by, by SRI, um, uh, the, the consultancy, in terms of sort of what the future of Internet of Things looks like, right? If we draw a straight line, where are we gonna end up 
sometime in 2020. And they're basically saying, you know, what we're seeing right now is we're seeing a lot of RFIDs, some basic things coming online, right? So with the uh, near field communication, we're seeing a lot of devices becoming network aware, um, if only for, for limited distances uh, so far. But with uh, LTE, we're basically gonna see uh, much more devices be enabled to go online and, and uh, be equal level citizens as our mobile devices are today. So this enables things like surveillance, security, healthcare, transportation, food safety, locating people, everyday objects, um, and so on and so on. So this is, we're projecting quite far into the future. So this line is likely gonna bend in, in certain other direction, but still it creates a whole new set of possibilities. Um, so, in terms of the adoption where we are today with LT, so this is not just some pipe dreams, it's actually happening, um, and the time is actually right now, the, a lot of, a lot of uh, carriers are getting online, so in North America, I'm sure you guys have been uh, watching the, the, you know, all the advertising that we're bombarded with and confused by, uh, with everyone, everyone claiming to have the fastest you know, 4G LT network. Latin America is planning a bunch of uh, launches this year. Uh, we're seeing Asia come online. Europe has been uh, doing LT for some time and they're expanding. So we're seeing a lot of new carriers uh, jumping um, on, onto, the, onto the bandwagon as well. So those are some, some, some countries and, and some numbers. At the same time, we're seeing the price of the actual devices come down quite a bit. So. Um, Around this year, we're seeing that basically the LT chips, so this is the price of the actual you know, raw hardware, the actual chipsets that, that you need to enable the endpoints, the actual devices, you know, either for, for human consumption or machi machine consumption. We're seeing that this is coming down below the commodity price line. So essentially, sometime this year, it doesn't really matter what it costs, it's cheap enough to plug in into a lot of different things. Right, so that that uh, sort of tipping point is happening right now uh, th this year. So this is why it's the, this is kind of timely. Um, so just a, a little bit about the evolution. Um, so uh, on the left we have you know certain technologies that you may or may not have seen before, but they basically represent what we are using today. Right. So these are the technologies that we are using with various carriers around the planet. Um, LT is a long-term evolution for all of these technologies. So the idea is that we're migrating all these different standards toward the same standard that, that the whole world more or less agrees in. Again, the, de the devil is in the detail, but we have a pretty good standard going on so far. So all the roads are leading in that direction. Um, so this is, uh, in terms of the services, uh, again, predictions, a little bit of a, you know, uh, future guessing. But um, as you can see, toward 2015, uh, you can see wh where the money is, which services are likely to produce the most returns for you as, as a developer, if you're developing new apps or innovating on top of this plumbing that we have called LT, right? So we're seeing that, you know, uh, the, the, the certain uh, premium services are, um, are becoming much more prominent than before. And the reason for this is because it's possible. We couldn't do it before. We just didn't have the infrastructure. So gaming, personalization, paid information, browsing, P2P messaging, music, uh, HD video conferencing, data networking, and so on. So everything is sort of growing, becoming uh, more prominent in the network. So that's the revenue, um, uh, in th that's compared to the revenue of those actual services. So a couple of best practices. If you, if you, you know, if you're sold on this, you want to innovate, you want to build stuff on top of um, LT, and you're interested in what is some of the best practices are, uh, here's just a couple of ideas so far uh, that, that we have. So first of all, the world is not going to be perfect. It's not like all of a sudden everyone's going to enable this IP-based network for us to, to work with. You as a developer need to worry about what kind of network the user is going to be. And the user is going to be flip-flopping between various networks. Right? So that's happening all the time today, and it's going to be happening probably for a couple of years until everyone builds out their infrastructure. So be ready to, uh, to uh, be intelligent about that in your application. So your application should be checking for the, the type of a network and should uh, you know, um, handle it accordingly. So 
you, you know, in Android, you have, you have hooks to connectivity manager. You can basically find out what kind of connection you, you really are on. So it's not just, hey, do I have a TCP IP stack? But it's also, what kind of a TCP IP stack do I have? Who's providing it, right? Um, so use, use bigger buffers. So basically, um, a, even though we're on different networks, the, the good assumption is to basically assume that you're going to be on a faster network. So build, you take, and make your buffers adhere to more of a, a full-on LT size so that you can, uh, you can basically move the traffic faster. This is going to work okay even when you're on a slower 3G network. Uh, but, but it's going to make a difference when you actually are or when your users are on a, on a faster 4G LTE network. Uh, prefetch for faster experience. So sometimes you, your app, you can sort of predict what the user is going to need. So if I'm opening up, you know, uh, if I'm opening up my, my Twitter app or my Facebook app, I can kind of predict that the typical behavior is going to be to check the statuses, see what my friends are doing, etc. So you can sort of be intelligent about prefetching some of the data in the background and taking advantage of that uh, happening while the user is doing something else. So by the time the user gets to that screen, uh, they can take advantage of that. Yes, yeah, the question. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So the question is, isn't this dangerous? Is uh, because on certain uh, car with certain carriers, you don't have the unlimited data plan. Not everyone is with Sprint, right? So you have to kind of uh, be careful about uh, you know using services that are gonna cost the user. Uh, money at the end of the day, right? So they're potentially uh, dangerous services. So in uh, and, and that's a correct statement. In, in Android, you know, we're we're sort uh, we're supposed to adhere to the best practices of actually checking if the user is okay with using the background services, right? So if you, you know if you're an Android developer, you would check what the user setting is um, for background services, and you would actually adhere to that. So you would not do prefetching in that case. Um, you d currently cannot find from the network easily if um, the data plan is limited or not. Um, but you can at least check the user preference assuming that the user set the preferences properly uh, given the network. So, so that's one sort of um, way to, to handle that you know, gracefully. Um, also, uh, you know, prefetching algorithms are not perfect. So this is all sort of a guess. Uh, it really depends on the type of applications. In certain applications, it's going to work better than others, right? Um, cache, cache more often. So um, you, we, we do have a databases in Android. The point of a database is in Android is really to kind of keep the data that is otherwise in the cloud. So if there's a case where you can um, uh, keep the data locally and essentially cache, that may be a good case. So for example, I was using Twitter as an example. You know, if I'm downloading Twitter statuses, they're not, they're not changing all that often. So I can basically cache the data locally. And in, the, in that case of Twitter, I don't need to, um, re, uh, I don't need to uh, basically expire my cache all that frequently. So that's, an, that's one of the easier algorithms. But you kind of can experiment with those algorithms and figure out what, what can work well for you. Um, one, one session for multiple gets. Um, so back to the battery um, life. Um, opening up multiple sessions can cost uh, money uh, or can cost battery juice. Um, when it comes to LT, LT has the feature of maintaining your sessions for a much longer period of time. This is something we did not have on 3G networks, right? So uh, LT is going to maintain this even though the user is basically flip-flopping across multiple networks. So user could go from 3G to, to LTE uh, and still maintain the session. So you basically want to uh, pull together a bunch of gets on the same session and basically do them on the same, on the same go. That also limits firing up the radio. So the radio consumes the power about 10, 10x compared to radio being off. So there's much more uh, you know, power consumption when, when it's being used. So might as well group those calls on the same session. So for example, you know, your, your Twitter, Twitter and your Facebook and your e Gmail, they can basically pull together and, and on, at the OS level and, and pull the data at the, in the same session as opposed to opening up multiple sessions, for instance. So that should give you a better responsiveness and, uh, and uh, a better uh, power, power consumption. Um, the advantages of IP network as well are something that you, know, you can take advantage of. So basically, 
if you have um, you, you have a very low latency. What that means is that as opposed to if you're streaming multiple things at the same time, say for example, streaming multiple movies, you could actually shut down one stream while starting the other. So you're essentially um, simulating multitasking, if you will, when it comes to network usage, just by shutting down one, restarting the other. And since you can do that uh, shutdown restart very efficiently, very quickly, user gets the, the experience as, as if they're running at the same time, although they're not. So that essentially limits your network bandwidth consumption and, and helps with the speed and helps with the power as well. So basically, starting a stream A, stopping a stream A, starting a stream B, and so on, and doing that flip-flopping very quickly. I think it, we're, we're talking about a couple of, um, you know, basically, um, you know, very low latency, 20 millisecond, milliseconds in latency, and very low uh, inactive to active uh, time to, uh, of about 100 milliseconds. So it's really, really fast to turn, turn a stream back on, right? Um, Favor downloading over streaming. Um, this goes back to flip-flopping the net uh, across the networks. So although you may be streaming a movie, um, if if a user is bouncing between a 3G and and, and a 4G and LTE, the experience may not be all that good. Uh, basically, HD video is not going to work very well on 3G. So um, favoring downloading may work better um, than than streaming in that case until we know that we're on a more of a solid uh, all IP all the time network. So that's just one of the ideas. Um, and f one of the f uh, last sort of, you know, best practices is to, to watch for those aggressive, uh, aggressive apps. By that I mean the apps that sort of lose a packet and then keep bugging the system to regain that connection back on, right? So um, th this can create basically blocking on the, on the, on the network thread by, by basically not allowing other apps to participate in the traffic as well um, and, and having an app that is constantly trying to ping the server, connect the server, and for whatever reason that is not working very, very well. So again, um, you know, uh, adhering to being a good citizen when it comes to writing, um, writing applications in general in, in, with respect to using, using the network. Um, and so finally, what, what I wanted to sort of uh, conclude with um, you know, I started by, by talking about the, the, how LT is sort of like the highway system uh, compared to the, you know, the road infrastructure that, that, that we have. So adaptability is something that's, that's, I think, very, very important. It's not usually the strongest that survives, survives. It's usually the most adaptable that survives. So this is a sort of a new network with new features. And we as app developers, we typically, um, I'm speaking for myself, we typically take the TCP IP stack in a mobile phone just for granted. It's just there, I just use it to connect to the network. Um, what we have now is an opportunity to rethink that and to basically become intelligent about how, or our apps can become intelligent about how they, they use the, the network, the underlying network that we are connected to. So, uh, so with that, um, these are some, uh, uh, the slides are gonna be available here um, and I just wanted to uh, kind of open it up for, for questions before uh, we move on. So, yeah, got it. So the statement is that basically with LT, the range is much wider, so you do not be, need to be as close to the tower as you do with the actual, um, with the actual uh, 3G and 2G networks. And that's correct. One thing that LT does is, is it's very smart about using multiple antennas. So it can basically be grabbing connectivity from various sources at the same time and that's way optimizing the performance of the network as well. So that, that, that's, that's correct, yeah. Okay, so the question is, if, I'm, if I heard it properly, is so we have Wi-Fi uh, today, and LTE is sort of like Wi-Fi, it's a little faster, so what's the big deal about LTE compared to, to, to Wi-Fi today? So uh, just to, you know, briefly compare it to Wi-Fi, so, uh, so yeah, you can, you know, say, say the speed is comparable, um, Wi-Fi is very limited in range, that's, that's one thing. Wi-Fi does have sec security, just like LTE, but um, it's a different type of a security. So it's not per subscriber-based security, right? So what LTE is allowing for is each individual device to authenticate itself on a network using a 15-digit uh, authentication number. So basically, not only do you know somebody is allowed to get on the network, but you know exactly who is that person, that, that, 
connection endpoint that's getting online. So from security standpoint, it's richer, right? Because you not only authorize, but you uh, not only authenticate, but you authorize as well, right? Um, so that's in terms of the security. Um, we, so we have the range. Another thing that you don't have necessarily on a Wi-Fi is the quality of service. So you know, uh, with LTE, you can basically uh, can, handle different uh, different services. You can have you know HD video prioritized over email or FTP download and that sort of stuff. So those are some some other advantages. Plus, it's a much wider range. Plus, it's going to handle automatic bouncing between various um, you know LTE endpoints. So who decides on a QoS today, right? Um, my understanding of that is that basically the carriers can set their policies. So they can say certain, you know, MIME type, if you will, gets, you know, or type of a, you know, packet uh, gets a priority over, over another. So that's why um, what's interesting now is before you didn't really care so much, as an app developer, you didn't really care so much about who your carrier is, right? Um, now you sort of want to work closer with the actual carriers because they're going to have different, you know, engage, rules of engagement when it comes to their network versus here's just a TCP IP pipe that, you know, you play with. So, so it's going to be a combination of those things. Right. So the, the, the statement is basically that um, if you have two endpoints, A and B, one supports QoS, the other one doesn't. So yes, you got to go with the least common denominator. So there's going to be some, you know, some, some uh, you know, poor experience at the point B. Yes, that's correct. So you have the question. So do I see a, uh, so the, the, the question has to do with the, the revenue expectation for services and how carriers are going to want to participate in that or do they today? Um, I would assume that the carriers are going to be highly uh, motivated to participate in, the, uh, in, in, in sharing the, the, the revenue from those value add services. Um, now, I, I don't know exactly how that's going to work. Yeah, so the question is about location-based services, and I think Alex is also uh, is touching on that as well. So that's one of the features now of the network. The network is smarter, knows much in mo much more detail who's who's where. So you can you can use the GPS, which takes forever to to locate. You can use the assisted network, which is not very granular, or you can ask this intelligent network for where the particular um, particular subscriber is, right? And, and so that's, that's one of the examples where network is actually helping, right? So we're bringing it to the level of a network. We're outsourcing it from an app stack down to the network stack, right? Um, so so that's, that's an interesting feature. Payments are an, another sort of something that people are experimenting with at the network level um, because it's more secure. Um, so, you, so it's, you know, plumbing that you don't need to build, basically. So, yeah. Cool. All right, thank you, guys.